Well, good morning, church. Yes. Thank you for clapping. I appreciate that. Um, we doing well this morning? We feeling all right? We're good? Okay, so there's a couple a couple head nods. Um, I wasn't with you guys last week. My wife and I went to Georgia and South Carolina with um, her family. Great time. My first thought was like, all right, Georgia, cool, but Savannah is shockingly beautiful. Anybody been to Savannah? It's it's stunning. Yeah, so it was a really fun trip, but we're continuing on in this series called Fulfilled. So if you weren't here last week, like myself, um, make sure to go back and listen. Austin spoke on communion, coming to the table, remembering of the body and the blood that was spilled and broken for us. And so definitely go give that a listen. Um, but otherwise, I, the, the past couple of weeks, there were a couple of different things that I kind of experienced, saw firsthand, that reminded me of one simple truth, and that humanity is broken. You guys feel that? Humanity is broken. It just, it, it was like set on a trajectory, and that was then set off course, and we experience the pains of that, the fracturing, the splintering of humanity. And there were these two things that I saw that kind of reminded me of that. And the first one was that the Denver Broncos wasted $84 million to get rid of their quarterback. The world is broken. I'm driving an 04 Corolla, and they were able to drop $84 million to get rid of a quarterback. We're talking, what, like 15 different quarterbacks in 10 years? This is terrible. It's terrible. world is broken. The second thing that I saw was I was, at a, I was at a coffee shop. This was in while we were in Savannah, and I saw a girl kind of sitting off in the corner. She's doing clearly homework, highlighters, notebook out, and she's, she's writing. But I noticed on her coffee, t- like on the desk, is it like a tripod with a camera on it, her iPhone? And I was like, oh, she's like maybe doing like a proctored exam. And, and then as I looked, I was like, but the camera's like moving. And she'd like move it to other angles and get like an over-the-shoulder shot and stuff. And as I sat there just judging this, this poor young girl, I realized that she was probably what the internet calls an influencer. She is an influencer. What I realized was how I can tell that the world is broken is because there are people online who are watching the most boring tasks ever invented things like homework or going to the grocery store and people enjoy that and they watch and then to just to just put the cherry on top I was reminded that this woman is most likely making more money than me as she was filming herself do homework. Humanity is broken. I'm playing. But we don't have to go far to see throughout, if we look back in history, that humanity is is really broken, right? If you just think a few hundred years ago in America and the practice of slavery, and then go a little bit sooner, and then we had World War II, and we had those Nazi concentration camps, and then go a little sooner, and we see the 9-11 attacks in New York City, and that feeling in our hearts is just this feeling of, oh, it's just a little broken. It just is off. And even think beyond humanity's control to things like uh, terminal disease or horrific natural disasters that come. And, and that feeling that we get is just that feeling of, it's off. Right? You guys feel this. It's off. And the truth is, humanity, society has no idea how to cope with this feeling. We have no idea what to do with the unanswerable questions, the things that don't make sense. I could argue that in today's society, we are more medicated than we have ever been. The use of alcohol, recreational drugs, illegal drugs, anti-anxiety medication, antidepressants, all those things, and I think some of it is an attempt to medicate and numb the brokenness that we see. I even saw a commercial the other day when we were in the hotel room of, of a prescription drug that you can take when other prescription drugs are causing you to freak out, and, and the warnings, have you seen those commercials? The warnings on the tail end of the commercial, the three top warnings, the first one was death, the second one was suicide, and the third one was bleeding from every crevice in your body. And you're just like, what? It's just broken. We're medicating to try to deal with so much of the pain in this life. And I could argue that in culture, we are lonelier than ever. You guys feel this all while being the most connected. The most connected generation is the loneliest. With TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and all these things, Ronald Rollheiser has a quote where he says, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. Oh, I feel that. I feel that. We're so connected, and yet we are lonelier than ever. And, and I think society, how another way they may be, we cope is you throw on another documentary or a series on Netflix, and you grab a big bag of Doritos, and you numb yourself all evening and you let that automatic play button just run all evening. 
we medicate, we cope. And then, and then as society medicates, often the response is when they realize that the Netflix isn't satisfying the inner craving in their heart, the fist or a specific finger gets thrown up to the sky and says, well, if you exist, God, why don't you do anything about it? Why don't you do anything about it? All because humanity is fractured. But I think if we could look in a little bit closer to our own hearts and our lives here in Loveland, we would see that we probably also have our own coping mechanisms. But the unique thing about Loveland and our specific situation and, is that if you play your cards right and you live in the right neighborhood and you get the right job, you can avoid much of the suffering. You can. If you, oh, I don't, I don't hang there. I don't go down to the grocery store down over there. Oh, man, I don't go stand. You can avoid much of the brokenness. And, and because of this, if you avoid it well enough, you can even avoid some of the emotions and the, and the questions that come from seeing brokenness. And so I think our coping looks a little different. And so when, when the sign of humanity's brokenness peaks its head in our life, maybe in a marriage, we'll just say, ah, well, we just, we need another vacation. We'll snap back into love. We just got to get some time away and we'll, we'll be good to go. We don't address the brokenness. And I think there, there's so many different things that we do. Here are a couple more. I think of like if, if your kids are in a rebellious phase or they are being rebellious and we simply label it a phase. Ah, it's just a phase. My, my kid, he'll grow out of it and he'll be good without realizing that humanity is fractured. Or when we see the homeless man on the side of the street, we're in that left turn lane and they're walking up and down and we refuse to make eye contact with them. And then as we peel out, we make a dehumanizing statement about what led to his or her demise as if we know it's to try to shield us from the brokenness. I think more popularly for many of us, what we do is we convince ourselves that a dozen or so more hours of overtime work um, is providing for the family when we know that the 40 hours previously given has already paid for all the expenses. But we do it to medicate or to numb or to hide. Or like most, we scroll and we scroll and we allow the algorithm do its, to do its work. And it protects us from the videos and the worlds we don't want to see, all while it entertains us and keeps us in the world that we do. And all of it because humanity is broken. And the point I'm trying to make this morning is that all of us, we have seen most likely firsthand or experienced the brokenness in society. And every single one of us, we have coping mechanisms. We have these practices that we run to, that we use to numb or to medicate or to ease the pain. But what I want to present to you this morning is the only person who can truly answer the unanswerable questions and ease our pain and still our emotions is Jesus. He's the only person he can do it. And I would even say that all of these Old Testament prophecies that we look at, all of the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies and this idea that we're going to talk about this morning about Jesus being our great, great high priest was to drive us to a place of intimacy with God. All of them exist to drive us to a place of intimacy with God. So with that being said, would you guys bow your heads? We're going to welcome the Holy Spirit this morning before we read. Well, God, we just invite your presence. We just ask that you would come and you would speak to us. Would your words speak to us? Would your word challenge us and correct us in areas that we need corrected? Lord, we want to just open our hearts to you. We want you to breathe just fresh life on the text that we're about to read. God, we ask that in all things you'd be glorified. And with the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart, would they be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. It's in your mighty name. Amen. All right, so you can open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, if, if you're unfamiliar where Hebrews is, you can just go to the very last chapter and then go a couple books forward and you'll probably be able to find it. It's also going to be up on the screen or in the YouVersion Bible app, but we're going to read in verse 14. Just three verses this morning. It's going to go pretty quick. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one in who every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The verse starts with this idea of since then we have this high priest. And so maybe, maybe you're kind of new to church, new to religion. Maybe this is your first time here. And so I'm going to just give a quick little summary about what a Old Testament high priest, what he did in the scriptures. So go, go back in your memory all the way to the Old Testament. 
go back a thousand, a thousand couple years and, and you get to the people of Israel and you get to this man named Abraham and God, the almighty God, Yahweh, the one that we worship today, he makes a covenant with Abraham and he says, Hey, from your lineage, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so they make this covenant commitment, God and man. And then from Abraham comes this people group called Israel. Right. And so God says, I want to be your God and I want you to be my people and I will dwell among you. But for a holy, righteous, perfect, just God to dwell among sinful, imperfect people, they needed God created, needed to create a system so that as you got closer to him, you on your own became holier and holy because Austin mentioned this verse last week, the wages of sin is death. And so when holiness is in the presence of sin, it consumes it. It destroys it. There actually needs to be a blood sacrifice for that sin. So God says, I'm going to come and dwell among you in this thing called the tabernacle. And there were three sections of the tabernacle. There was the inner, there was the most holy place. This is where Yahweh, God dwelled in a pillar of smoke and fire behind a veil. And then go a step further out. And there was, these were called the inner courts. And then you go to the furthest and it was almost like a gate around the outside, a fence that was put up that was called the outer courts. And so Israel, to, to allow for the holy God to dwell in their midst behind this veil, they would, every single section, they would offer sacrifices for their sins. And they would kill an animal. There were also free will sacrifices that would have been given. But all of Israel, all of the people group was allowed to come into these outer courts. And they would step into these outer courts and they would kill goats and lambs for their sin. And it was how there was relationship between God and man. And then from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the Levites, God chose them to be priests in the tabernacle. It was basically a modern day pastor or minister. And they worked full time in the tabernacle. And now the Levites were only allowed to go into the inner courts. And then here's where the great high priest comes in. Then once a year, God would have one man from the tribe of Levi, who was called the great high priest, who would enter into the most holy place or the holy of holies. And there was a separation of the veil. And once a year, they would tie a rope around his ankle and he would go in and he would actually behold the glory of the Lord in a pillar of smoke and fire. And he would offer sacrifices. He would burn incense to the Lord. So when we look at Hebrews, what the author is saying is that we now have a new great high priest and that person is Jesus. You guys following along? Okay, great. The second thing that I noticed from this text that I'm going to spend a portion of the morning on is this idea that we have a God who can sympathize with our weakness. We have a God who can sympathize with our weakness. He was tempted as we are, yet he did not sin. This idea of sympathy is that God can relate with us. We, that God actually can feel, he felt what we feel on earth. Like all the brokenness I talked about at the beginning of the sermon, like God feels that brokenness. And what's really unique is that there are multiple prophecies that were given in the Old Testament that speak about God's brokenness, about him being able to sympathize with our weakness. He was mocked, he was abandoned, he was dehumanized, he was betrayed. And all of these are Old Testament prophecies that then Christ fulfill that we're going to look at. So starting in Matthew 27, verse 3 through 5, we see that the almighty God was betrayed. And it says, Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, Well, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed. So Jesus, the almighty, perfect God, who's now walking on the earth, experienced betrayal. Someone who was in his inner circle actually sold his life for 30 pieces of silver. That's to fulfill the prophecy that was given in Zechariah 11, verse 13, that says, So I took the 30 pieces of silver and I threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. And then to go a step further of Jesus being betrayed, he was also dehumanized. He was, he was actually treated as the least of the least because in the law of Moses, if you go all the way back again, a slave's price was simply 30 pieces of silver. And this is what it says here in 21 verse 32 of Exodus. If the ox gores a slave, male or female, the owner shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver and the ox shall be stoned. So the lowest person in society at the time would have been a slave and the price of their life was simply 30 pieces of silver. So I don't know where you find yourself this morning, but when the scripture says we have a God who can sympathize with our weakness, I don't know if you feel like you've been betrayed 
or you feel like you've been dehumanized or you feel like you're the lowest of the low, but we have a God who can sympathize with that pain, with that weakness. This continues on. Jesus was mocked and he was abandoned. Matthew 27, verse 39 and 46. While Jesus is up on the cross, it says this, and those who passed by him derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. The next group of people come in to join and mock him. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him saying, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And then the next group joins in. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. And now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus the almighty God is mocked. He's made fun of. It's, it's so crazy. The lamb of God, the one who breathed creation to existence is being mocked by the very man he brought up from the dust. The king of heaven's armies, the one who, who rides on the clouds with fire in his eyes and a sword coming from his mouth and a tattoo on his thigh is being mocked by the creation he himself is in charge of. We have a God who can sympathize with our, with our weakness this was to fulfill the prophecy that was given in Psalms 22, verse 1 through verse 8. And what's so unique about this prophecy is it was given hundreds, if not thousands of years beforehand by King David. And, and in Jewish practice, when you would, as you would go to school as a Jewish boy, you would learn much of the Psalms. You would commit many of these to memory. So it is, it is very likely that the Jewish people who are in the crowd mocking Jesus are familiar with this Psalm and would have known it as a prophetic Psalm. And so when Jesus is up on the cross, he actually quotes this Psalm to say, I am the fulfillment of Psalms 22. So let's read this together. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. And then here's this unique statement to speak of Christ. But I am a worm. And not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me, they mock me. They make mouths at me and they wag their heads. And then this is the direct quote that the religious leader said while Jesus was on the cross. He trusts in the Lord. Let God deliver him. Let God rescue him for he delights in him. So as Jesus hung upon the cross, he would have experienced intense separation from God the Father. It says that in the scriptures that God the Father actually turned his back on him because in 1 Corinthians it says, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Christ actually became sin and in that moment he experienced separation. So when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's both a feeling of abandonment, but it's also a statement of I am the fulfillment of Psalms 22. And this is what's so beautiful about Psalms 22. That statement of I am a worm. What a weird statement in the scriptures. But if you actually look a little bit closer, they're speaking of a specific worm that was called the scarlet worm. And I want to read an excerpt from a book written by Henry Morris. It's called The Biblical Basis for Modern Science. And this is what the scarlet worm, this is how the scarlet worm acted and how it lived. It says, when the female of the scarlet worm species was ready to give birth to her young, she would attach her body to the trunk of a tree, fixing herself so firmly and permanently that she would never leave again. The eggs deposited beneath her body were thus protected until the larvae were hatched and able to enter their own life cycle. And as the mother died, the crimson fluid stained her body in the surrounding wood. And from the dead bodies of such female scarlet worms, the commercial scarlet dyes of antiquity were extracted. What a picture this gives of Christ dying on the tree, shedding his precious blood that he might bring many sons into glory. He died for us that we might live through him. How beautiful is that? That Jesus, while he is up on a tree, he's referencing a scarlet worm. That says, I'm going to offer my life so that life would flow from me. And it's not a dye that stained the tree. It's not a dye that stained the wood, but it was his own blood. Jesus is the fulfillment of Psalms 22. 
But this is all to prove that we have a God who can sympathize with our weakness. He was abandoned, he was mocked, he was dehumanized. Here's, here are a couple of other things that Christ experienced. He would have experienced physical pain beyond any one of us could ever imagine. He received 39 lashes from a whip that was designed to dismember and unidentify the person being whipped. And, and if you look back in Roman culture, the whips actually had shards of glass or rocks or knots on the end of it with the sole purpose of ripping out human flesh. Then after being whipped 39 times because they would believe that 40 would most likely kill a man, they then crown him with thorns and they lodge it deep into his skull, causing throbbing pain and give, disorienting his ability to think. He was then forced to carry a cross through the dirt while the crowds gathered, spit, mocked, and hit him all the way up to this cursed hill where they put it in the ground and then they pierced his hands and his feet. And then every single time Jesus would have to take a breath, he would have to drag his raw and exposed back up against the splintered wood. He would have died of constrained blood circulation, organ failure, and asphyxiation. Every single breath would have been a battle for life. Our God has experienced physical pain. Relationally, he was abandoned, denied, misunderstood, and betrayed by people closest to him. Think even beyond his own disciples. Think of like this is Jesus growing up in a small town and they would have known him. And then as he grew, he began to taught. And then opinion would have shifted and people would think that he's a, a heretic and crazy and that he is deserving of death because he spoke contrary to the Torah. These are people that Jesus would have probably known in the crowd as they mocked him. He was betrayed by his own people group. He was unfairly tried and unfairly sentenced spiritually. He then was, he actually, they placed all the weight of the sin on him in a moment. Like just even for a moment, think in your own life when you really messed up, when you really made a mistake and you really sinned and that feeling of shame, of regret, of filth, of disgust, whatever that emotion came over you, now multiply that infinitely and take all the sin of the past, present, and the future, and it was laid on our king. And then all while being separated from God the Father, Jesus experienced spiritual turmoil, physical pain, in ways that we could never understand. And the reason for that, this is what the Hebrew author says, we have a God who can sympathize with us. So I don't, I don't know the seasons of life that you guys are in. I don't know the battles that you face. I don't know the questions that come across your mind, but there is a God who can relate to you. There's a God who understands the challenges. He understands the brokenness of this world. But the beautiful thing is that it's not left there. God doesn't just say, okay, I can sympathize with you. What does the, what, what the author of Hebrews say next in the passage? He says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Because we have this great high priest who can sympathize with our weakness and he was tempted as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. The reason why I love this idea of Jesus being our great high priest is the middleman has been removed. The middleman has been removed. We don't need a priest. We don't need a pope. We don't need a confessional booth. All of a sudden, I have direct access to the very ear of the almighty God. I have relationship. The new covenant has been enacted. The veil has been torn. I now have his voice. I can hear him. Church, this is such a good thing. This is such a good thing that Jesus is now our great high priest because I don't have to go to a pastor to talk to the Lord. I can talk to him now. He's not a God who sits up in the clouds with lightning in his hand. It says that, no, he is the humble healer. He's the suffering servant. The scriptures actually say that Jesus being equal with God did not count himself equal with God and he humbled himself and he took the form of a servant. That is the God we come to. When we run into his arms, we have a God who can sympathize with us. And listen to the author's tone here. I think this is just an encouragement for us when it says, since then we have this great high priest. That moment since it's almost like it feels like he's saying it to a group of people who have maybe missed it. He's like, since then we have a great high priest. Don't, don't miss the opportunity. So church, don't miss the opportunity to come before the Lord, to bring your cares and your fears and your doubts and lay them before the Lord because he can sympathize with us. And then I love this. How are we supposed to approach God? With confidence, not timidly, not with shame, not with embarrassment, but with your shoulders high and your chin up, that you can actually run to the loving arms of a father with confidence. You can approach him. I visualize it so much in the same way of a loving parent who if their child in a moment is crying or hurt or in pain, 
And you hear that cry and the response of a parent is to bend down and grab them. The child does not have to clean up themselves prior to coming, right? All the donut crumbs and maybe urine stains, you know what I'm saying? Like the response of a parent is to bend down and embrace the child. That is the response of God to us. I, I don't have to clean myself up first. He's right there. So he says, with confidence, come to me. And then I love this. What do we receive? We receive mercy and we find grace. We receive mercy and we find grace. Mercy is not receiving that which I deserved. And if you look at the cross and you look at the 39 lashes and you look at the, the nails in his hands and the crown that was placed on his head, that, was, that should have been us. That is what we deserved for our sin. But that punishment was actually laid on Jesus. And so now the scriptures say that when God the Father looks at us, he sees his son Christ. It says that we are actually hidden in Christ. But then you go, well, I, I might use up all the mercy. That's not going to happen. Ephesians 1, it says, but God being rich in mercy, not empty, not empty or running out. We can't outuse the mercy of God. It says in the scriptures that his mercy is new every single day. So we could have confidently come before the throne of grace and we're met by mercy. The lamb who died for us and now we're hidden in his wing. And then we get to find grace. Grace is, is receiving something that I do not deserve. Grace is actually something that empowers us to live righteously. It actually lifts our head. It, it gives us clarity of focus. It gets us out of the pit. And God says, come and I will give you mercy and I will give you grace. I will give you mercy and I will give you grace. And then finally, I love this. When do we get to receive this mercy and grace? In our time of need. How beautiful is that? Is that just not a statement of a loving father who in your time of need, come to me and I will give you mercy and grace. And I love this because it's not wait for next week to hear the pastor talk and I get to hear the words of the Lord or not even, no, not even until next morning when I sit down and I spend time with the Lord. It is in your very moment of need. You can call upon his name. So maybe you find yourself this week and you're in a cubicle, is, are cubicles even a thing anymore? I don't think they really are. <laughs> You're punching numbers in a spreadsheet and a question of purpose or calling. Or man, am I, am, I, am I obeying your voice? In your moment of need, you can call upon the name of the Lord and receive mercy and find grace. And maybe you're home with the kids and that youngest child is losing it again. And the older child needs help with math homework and the spouse is not home to offer a reprieve from the chaos. And in that moment... You can call upon the name of the Lord and you will be met with mercy and grace. Or maybe for you, the children are long gone and the house feels a little too quiet and that feeling of loneliness, the spirit of depression tries to make its way in. And in that moment, you can call upon the name of the Lord. Psalms 120, it says, I look up to the mountains for where does my help come from? Oh, it comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. How beautiful is that? I love this quote by Brother Lawrence. He says this, he says, God does not ask much of us, merely a thought of him from time to time, a little act of adoration, sometimes to ask for his grace, sometimes to offer him your sufferings, and at other times to thank him for the graces past and present. He has bestowed on you in the midst of your troubles to take solace in him as often as you can. Lift up your hearts to him during your meals and in company. The least remembrance will always be the most pleasing to him. One need not cry out very loudly. He is nearer to us than we think. How beautiful is that? I just think of the words of Jesus in Matthew when he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and the promise you will find rest for your souls. That is the invitation of the Lord. Now that he is our great high priest and because he fulfilled all of these prophets, he says, come confidently to me and I will meet you with grace and mercy in your time of need. But I think there's, as, as I've talked about this and this is near to my heart and we as a church have talked about this idea of intimacy with God. I think there are plenty in the room who will often go, man, I, like I, I give it a shot. But when I read the Bible, that's, that doesn't stand out that way. Or man, it doesn't impact me the same way. Or I want to feel his presence, but I can't. I try to pray, but it doesn't work. And I just, I want to speak to this really quick. There is a truth in scripture that says, when you draw near to the Lord, he will draw near to you. 
It's a promise of scripture. We see it in Deuteronomy 4.29, James 4.8, and Matthew 7.7. 7. The caveat to this statement is in Deuteronomy 4.29. He says, but from wherever you're at, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Your whole heart. And I think what is very unique when we look at scripture is there's almost always an exchange. And I think if we look back to the coping mechanisms that I mentioned at the beginning, the things that we run to to try to medicate or numb, maybe it's a glass or a drink of alcohol or too many, maybe it's scrolling through TikTok and getting a dopamine hit, whatever it may be, often there is an exchange required. Look at Luke 9.23. It says, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. The exchange is you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and you get him in the end. The same is said throughout the scriptures of you will actually find your life when you lose it. There's always an exchange in the kingdom of God. And my encouragement to us is if you feel like you're in the room, you're like, man, I, tr I, I, try, to, I try to pray, I try to read, and I just don't feel this mercy and grace that God speaks of. Because the beautiful thing, grace is free. Praise the Lord. Mercy is free. That has been lavished and poured out upon us. And it's nothing that we can do. It's so that no one can boast. But for us to experience the presence of God and to feel the nearness of God, there's an exchange that needs to happen. And it might be going this coping mechanism that I've been running to. I actually have to exchange it to feel the nearness of God. Because I think if we were to inventory our lives, for many of us, like I, even in my own life, there's been times where I am dedicated to something and it has my whole heart. It has all my, it could be exercise. It could be hobbies, fishing, hunting. It could be sports. It could be video games. It could be work. And we have all of these things in our life, but the exchange is often God going, you have to give that up so that I can fill you. I think I've heard it said that you need to empty a cup before it can be filled with something new. I love A.W. Tozer. He has a quote. He says, the deeper we go into the presence of God, the less we're allowed to bring with us. Oh, is that not true? That as we go deeper into the beauty and the majesty of God, the less I'm allowed to hold on to of the world. So I just, I want to encourage you. We're going to spend a little time reflecting. But this idea of I can come boldly before the throne of grace and I can receive mercy and I can find grace. And you might be going, I want to feel that mercy. I want to feel that grace. Then I want you to ask the question, are there competing affections in your life? Is there something competing for the affection in your life? Is there something that is outweighing the scale to where God says, I want you to come, but you got to leave that behind. You got to leave that behind. Because we all have coping mechanisms. We do. And I think one of the really cool invitations in a story from the Old Testament that really encourages me is the story of Jacob. Jacob was known as the deceiver. <laughs> And, and he's out one night wrestling with what people say the almighty God, an angel of the Lord. And he's wrestling with this, with this angelic being, with the divine. And, and he's wrestling and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And the angel says, well, the day, daybreak is about to come and you're going to see my face. And so he puts Jacob's hip out of place and he renames Jacob to Israel, which means you have striven with God and you have won. And Jacob never walks the same, but there's blessing that follows him. And so I think the encouragement for all of us, when we face these, these broken things in life, the unanswerable questions, the questions of purpose and the challenges, we have an opportunity to bring those questions and wrestle with them with the Almighty. We get to wrestle with God. We can actually bring them before the Lord because the fulfillment of all of these Old Testament prophecies, the 300 that Taylor, Taylor mentioned, Austin mentioned a really cool thing at the beginning of the service, that those serve to give us confidence that God was fully man and fully God. It actually helps us go, he was a real man, like no, but he's also fully God. But it doesn't end there. It's always meant to drive us closer to a place of intimacy with him. All the challenges, all the questions, all the chaos, all the fracturing in the world, those things, their design is to drive us to the very heart of God. And yet what they often do for a quick fix, we run to the coping mechanisms in our life. We take another drink, we scroll, whatever it may be. And God is saying, come to me, come wrestle with those questions. And what I'll tell you right now, God does not promise that every emotion in your heart will be eased or every question will be answered, but we get him in the process. We get the person of Jesus in the process. So would you guys stand with me? We're going to have a little bit of a moment of reflection, but we did, we got a word um, kind of at the, during worship that just the John three sixteen was highlighted 
of just receiving the love of the Father. Because I, I do think with this exchange and this idea of sometimes I have to lay things down to receive all that the Lord has for me, there are also some of you in the room who most likely you need to just sit and receive. And I know my, my heart's tendency being a little perfectionistic is I'll just, I'll work harder. I'll just work harder and I'll feel the presence of God. And there are some of you who in the room who you need to sit down at your kitchen table, open your Bible and go, I receive the grace that you have promised me. And it's not in my own doing, right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, the exchange he made was far greater than any exchange that we will ever make. And so I also wanna invite the prayer team to come forward. And then we're gonna spend a little bit of time reflecting. But if you are just, if you find yourself in this moment, like, no, I could actually, I would love to receive a fresh encounter of, of the Lord. Then I would love for you to come down and the prayer team would love to pray with you because there's an exchange that happens. God gave his son and the response can be that you can feel the nearness of the Holy Spirit. But the other thing I want to just spend some time sitting on is, um, are, is there a competing affection in your life? Is there a coping mechanism that you run to? Something that you use to medicate or to numb, to escape? Because the Lord says, come to me. I am your great high priest. You can come confidently in your time of need and I will meet you. So if you would just close your head, <laughs> bow your heads, close your eyes, extend your hands. And let's just welcome the Holy Spirit for a moment and just ask him to reveal, is there something off in our hearts? Is there something that I'm running towards? Is there something in this world that I'm medicating with that should be you? we ask that you would just reveal it. So for just a moment, I'm going to stop talking. Could we just sit and just listen? Yeah, Lord, if there is a coping mechanism in our hearts, or if there is something that we are running to, we just lay it down. The beauty of repentance is turning the other way. So God, we just lay things down and we want to run to you and you alone. Psalms 139 says, point out, point out in me anything that is offensive to you. So would you just point out in our hearts anything that is offensive to you and would you lead us along the path of everlasting life? We love you. It's in your mighty name. Amen.